This podcast contains potentially adult language, adult themes, definitely drinking, and possibly sexual context. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Drinking with Authors. I am your host, Erica Lance. My co-host today is Valerie Willis, who I'm sure will make a spectacle of herself. And our amazing guest today, I'm counting on it. I'm sure another manatee story is going to come out. Jonathan Mayberry. Let's talk about what we're drinking. So our sponsor today is Skunk Brother Spirits. DWA10 is the coupon code you can get from them. They're amazing. But I'm in an Airbnb, and apparently they don't let you travel with large bottles of open whiskey on planes. Whatever. Fine. Whatever. So I have Angry Orchard, but it's their unfiltered. So it's apparently hazy and less sweet, which I did not think was a good marketing line necessarily, but it's hazy and less sweet. You could describe me through my whole college years, hazy and less sweet, you yeah. Yeah, that's actually me after probably about four shots. Um, (laughs) What are you drinking, my friend? My attempt at an Irish coffee. Oh, dear God. I'm going to need to understand what that entails. So will the um, the audience who knows how terrible you are drinking. It's Folgers coffee and um, a total guesstimate of Bailey's. And then I shoved a little bit of my cream brulee creamer in there to kind of I don't know. I don't know. It, it tastes great. <laughs> I, th- I think you need a new name for it because Irish coffee is whiskey. Yeah. Whiskey I was thinking, okay. Coffee. So I don't even know what I'm doing. So that's what I'm saying. I don't drink. I usually. Okay. <laughs> so me and Erica are in the same place. She makes the drink and it's whatever she makes me is what I'm drinking. Occasionally I will get a bottle of wine and I, and at least that has an established name or thing. Other times my friends buy me these three pack little mini things for me to try and those kick my ass off here every time. This is the only time I drink. <laughs> so this is um we're gonna change that when you go to Dragon Con, but we'll we'll let you try to order a drink and see. The other day she was like, I'm gonna make a Long Island iced tea. And I'm like, you realize there's no iced tea in that, right? And she goes, What? And I'm yeah, all like, juice. Yeah, it's all, it's all, it's okay. Except for a I don't think she could survive a Long Island iced tea ever. Uh, so, um, Jonathan, you are drinking something fairly amazing. Do share with us, please. Yes, I'm drinking Brothers Bond bourbon. It's uh, the the new bourbon created by um, eight, my friend Ian Summerholder, who started in V Wars, and his Vampire Diaries co-star, Paul Wesley. And it's like blowing up around the world. It's massively popular. And... Um, it is a darn good bourbon. So cheers. Very cool. Very cool. Cheers, cheers, cheers. So this is your second time being on this delightful podcast, which we'd love to have you back because you're amazing. And Valerie's still embarrassed and wowed by the last time we were together due to the fact that she is, was completely hammered. And I finished <laughs> off a, pretty much a bottle of Tennessee whiskey. Um, so what are you, what have you been up to? Oh, good Lord. Um, how long ago was that? Was that about a year ago? I think it was years years ago. Ago. Years ago. Yeah. Uh, well, I've written seven novels since then. Um, what? Yeah. Seven? Yeah. I've, I write three to four novels a year right now. Um, I've, I'm actually starting my third novel this year. Um, well, one I kind of overlapped with the last year. And um, so, yeah, I, I'm writing a lot of, lot, of, lot of novels, writing a lot of short stories. I'm the editor of Weird Tales magazine, uh, which is a whole bunch of fun. We're, um, we have an issue coming out this week. We have an issue coming out in June that will actually feature um, Michael Moorcock, Neil Gaiman, and other people. Um, wow. Moorcock gave us an a- a- excerpt of his ne- the latest Elric novel. He's one of my favorite, favorite, favorite writers of all time. And Neil Gaiman gave us an essay about Michael Moorcock, which is like really cool, and a bunch of other folks. And, and so we, we're doing that. And it's just like, you know, one thing after another, I, um, you know, project comes along, my, my agent sells it. She has seven books sold that I have not yet written. Wow. And I am, I'm on my 46th novel right now since 2000. And Congrats. that's amazing. That is thoroughly amazing. So how many words per year is that averaging? I don't know. It's, it's um, I write on average between three and 4,000 words a day. Not every day is that, but some days are more. Like when I'm 
Uh, I just finished uh, my second epic fantasy novel um, a month ago. And the last two weeks of that, I was writing something like any, anywhere from four to seven or 8,000 words a day, plus short stories. And it takes me a day or two to write a short story. I did one on Sunday that was six, 50... 600 words and I did it in one day, you know, uh, in two sittings. So it, it really varies, but it's it's a lot. It's a lot of fucking That is a lot. It's a lot. Of a, that is a lot. I feel dwarfed now completely. I, I now have very muscular <laughs> fingers from all that typing. They're very I was going to say, no carpal tunnel here. Yeah, Man, yeah. that is crazy. Okay, but you have a book with you because we're doing, we can put, hold this up and do shameless self promotion plug of this book. This is my first epic fantasy novel. It comes out May 10th, very soon. Uh, also, it uh, will be my longest published book, though the one that comes after it, the sequel to this is actually longer. Um, and um, it, I had more fun writing that than I think I've ever had doing anything else in my writing career. Um, really? Which is, which is weird because I, you know, I've read a lot of epic fantasy growing up. The very first book I ever bought, in fact, you can see it. I mean, tilt my computer up. Right above my finger is... Mm -hmm. Conan the Wanderer. It's the paperback from, 19, from the 60s. It was the first book I ever bought with my own money. Uh, not that copy. I wore out my original copy. Um, so I, I read a lot of Robert E. Howard, you know, Conan stuff. I read Roger, uh, Roger Zelazny's um, uh, Amber novels and, and Fafford and the Grey Mauser and, and everything Michael Moorcock did. Um, big fan of it. But I never really thought about writing it. And then my editor, just less than two years ago, called me out of the blue and said, you know, we had a, a, a meeting talking about what we want to do with, you know, next. He's with the St. Martin's Griffin division of, of Macmillan. Okay. And, um, you know, somebody suggested we, we should probably put more of a, um, you know, have a deeper footprint in, in epic fantasy. And, do you, you know, they, the publisher asked the editors, can anybody know a writer who's willing to, who's interested in doing that? And I'm kind of like the, there's, there used to be a, a, a serial commercial call, uh, for life where was this little kid named Mikey who, you know, nobody oh, yeah. would give it to him. I'm the, Mikey, I'm the Mikey of, of, pub, you know, of writing where if anything weird comes along, they'll assume because I'm a weirdo that I will try it. Um, and often I do and often it's fun. But he asked me if I wanted to write it, write something. And could I pitch? And I had a pitch to him within a half an hour. And within two hours, we had a two book deal locked in. I mean, it was wow. kind of the fastest thing bang, ever. Bang, bang. And wow. And the book is 176,000 words, and it took me just under four months to write. I had an insane amount of fun writing this. That's, um, that makes me dizzy when you say the word count. I just get dizzy, and I'm like, well, well, I just the, the, need, hold on, I need another drink. Let me just. The, 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 yeah, the sequel to this, which is called uh, Son of the Poison Rose, which comes out in January, so it's not even a whole year after, is 207,000 words. That's a long yeah, I need another drink. Yeah, I think I'm going to need, <laughs> need to drink a lot. I have a six pack. Thank God. But um, the, so, the, 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 writing the book, by the way, was not only so much fun, but it allowed me to, to put my own stamp on epic fantasy. Um, it's a lot of, you know, the politics and religion of that fantasy world. You know, it's actually 50,000 years from now, our society completely collapsed down to barbarism and crawled slowly back up. And this is a future version of earth where they don't even remember our culture nothing of us remains and um, i even have warring religions in there one of which is harvest religion they're the good guys then there's hastor who is the shepherd god king in yellow james Ch uh, robert chambers classic story oh yeah yeah it's that, it's that god and for those people who who do deep dives into lovecraftian uh stuff Hastor is also the half brother of Cthulhu, so the other religion is Cthulhu, and he's not the bad guy. At least his religion is not. Okay, I have to ask this question. Going back to, we're Scooby Dooing back for a moment. You <laughs> said they reached out to you, and you were like, "I have a pitch in a half an hour." Had you been thinking about anything high fantasy? Well, you just were like, hmm, "What would I write about?" I know a, a, a bit of a bit of both. I mean. Um, earlier in my career, that would have taken a, a few days, partly shock, and then, you know, a few days of, oh, my God, what am I going to pitch? But, you know, it's been, I've been doing this full time for, you know, since uh, my first novel came out in 2006. 
So I'm more used to being able to pitch on the fly. Plus, I love pitching. I even teach a class called The Art of the Pitch where the writing students give me a genre, subgenre, name of a character, crisis, and uh, title, and I will make up a book and pitch it on the spot. So, you know, I, and I, it's teaching people not to be afraid of pitches, to have fun with it. The elevator pitch is gold. You got it. You yeah. got to have it down. Exactly. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, almost any writer who is multi-genre, and I'm, I've, you know, my career's been built on jumping from one genre to another, usually has not full ideas, but bits and pieces of ideas kind of floating like a, an amorphous cloud around their head. And every once in a while, two things will connect and, you know, clunk, you have an idea. So when he said Epic Fantasy, you know, I had a character name, but uh, Kagan, but I never had a story for Kagan. I just had the name. I like the name Kagan. I'm not sure why, you know, it's probably somebody's last name that I, you know, stuck in my head. And um, I, I, I thought, well, what, what would I want to write? What would I enjoy spending a lot of time doing if it was Epic Fantasy? And I, I come up with an idea, um, typed it fast. It was, you know, like three paragraphs long. And uh, he walked right back into the meeting with it. And the publisher said, you know, here's what we can offer. Get his agent on the line. It's done. Wow. That is amazing. So let me, let me ask this, because we've talked about your other genres all the way back to your bowling book, which I'm still on the hunt for, by the way. Yes, we've been both I'm looking. Yeah, I've been asking it, around I have, I have looked for that book so often. I can find That's the judo book, but not the bowling book. Yes, no, that is it's part of one of our hashtag life goals for me and Valerie at this point in time is to find the damn bowling book so we can get you to sign it. But epic fantasy, I think, and, and may be wrong from your perspective, takes a lot of, it, it's a lot of world building and tracking world building, um, kind of like you do like a massive D&D campaign, like how does this work? Um, did you find yourself doing a world building book for this particular book? Um, not so much world building book. I mean, I have files like these are this is the religion this is the economy and so on i you know i haven't put them all into one master document i just search on what i need or some of it's making it up on the spot like i don't do a ton of world building before i get to points in the story where the world building needs to be thought out and then i i call it incidental world building and i build from there but what i did first is i started out with a map um and i want to show the, the maps in the book i love maps and books this version of the map was, was done by Kat Scully, who was a fantastic map maker. My version looked like it was done by somebody who'd had a cerebral accident, but uh, her version of the map came out much better. Oh, wow. Yeah, and with the map, you start, you know, and, and you start you know, making decisions on distances and so on. It, there's a kind of interior logic that just starts showing up. Like, um, you draw on history. I mean, I know a lot about history, um, you know, the, the Greeks, the Phoenicians, the, uh, and you, you, you borrow bits and pieces of that to make a logical progression and evolution of a culture. And then if you have a successful culture, like an empire, who is in opposition to it? Um, so that helps you, you start seeing you know, both sides of it, because just because the good guys, from my perspective, is one empire, it doesn't mean the the people in opposition to it are bad guys. They are in opposition. Um, and even the villain in the story, known as the Witch King, his, you know, when I was creating him and his motivations and, you know, you know the culture he's from, uh, I was able to get inside his head so that I could see a worldview that was not just black and white. He, you know, he's not like, hey, I'm evil. It's he really thinks he's he's doing the right thing. Right, he, he feels he's writing a great wrong that was done a thousand years ago. And now he's he has the power to change it. So that made it fun to do. And when you create characters like that, the world building starts wrapping itself around each character. You know, there's a reason that person is in the story, where they come from, why are they doing it, and so on. And to me, that is that's just so much fun to do. Well, that's, that's pretty epic, and you have these books coming out. Also, Val, I'll let you go in a second. But you have these two books coming out um, less than a year apart from each other. Yeah, May and then January. And then what happens when they come back and go, okay, we need more? I, I just got an email from my, my agent today saying that they are now ready for the pitches for the next couple of books, and I already know what the next couple of books are going to be because I know, you know, I didn't write these as standalones. I wrote it as a, as a progressing story, kind of like 
the way Game of Thrones is done, where each book advances certain storylines to a certain point, and there is some degree of resolution within each book, but the bigger story goes forward. Um, and the war against the Witch King is, is going to continue at least three books, possibly as many as four. And then- Well, do we ever that, really destroy the Witch King? Even though we think we did, do we ever um, really? Mm. Well, there's, there's a, <laughs> there are a lot of really <laughs> fun mysteries around that character, including who what his real identity is. And um, in fact, we, we got a great cover quote from Michael Moorcock for the book. And, oh, wow. Um, he sent me an email um, saying that it is rare for him to be surprised by by the, the re of a reveal in a fantasy novel, and he was completely surprised and called me a bastard. So, <laughs> yes, go I, I will drink to that. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. drink to that. Yes. Okay, Valerie's been dying to ask the question, and we've shunned her off. Go ahead, Val. Well, I, I was going to say, like, it comes up in discussion a lot with, because um, I teach a, a number of workshops myself, and I'm always telling them that, you know, if you want a strong villain, they have to be a hero in their own head and in their own oh, yeah. storylines. Even, even, um, uh, even then, they must enjoy some part of what they're doing, mm -hmm. because otherwise, where's their motivation? Well, um, and... And I would like to hear your thoughts on the importance of creation, creating a, a strong villain. Um, to, to that very point, um, the, the, the central political force when the book starts, like on page one, is something called the Silver Empire. It's lasted for a thousand years. It's run by empresses, known as the Silver Empresses. And um, they're seen as the good guys. The, the, everything west of this mountain chain you know, on the map is, is part of this empire. But the thing is, when they formed the empire, the silver empresses hunted down and exterminated magic. Anyone who's a magic user, you know, was was either killed or forced to stop practicing or whatever. Um, and for the, the the nation of the villain Hakia, th their religion is magic. So they've been repressed religiously for a thousand years. So the, the Witch King finally figures a way to, to regain some magic power. And he uses it to conquer the Silver Empire in one night. And that's, by the way, on page one. He conquers the entire empire in one night, page one. Hit the ground Every, running, John. I love it. <laughs> yeah, so it's not a spoiler. Um, in fact, it's even in the jacket text. You know, But his view is that magic is, the, is a religion. It's a, it's a powerful, positive thing. It connects us to the natural world and the larger world. So to repress it and to chase out, you know, in, in the repression, the fairy folk and everything were, were chased out of this plane of existence. And he felt that was um, an evil done to the world. So he's trying to heal that evil. At the same time, he knows that his methods, you can't conquer an empire nicely. So he's, he's pretty brutal about it. But at the same time, you know, he has a point. So, and it's fun writing about the return of magic. That that's what last. So, did you have to? You I mean, you talked a little bit about how you wrote, but did you keep track of the magic rules and how it works? Yeah, yeah. Um, because the magic rules are kind of like the way magic manifests on Earth, since this is a future version of Earth. Um, so the fairy folk have their type of magic, and and uh, one of the characters in the story is the the daughter of the queen of the, of the immortal queen of the fairies, and. Um, She's uh, also, I don't know how versed you are in poetry, but she's also La Belle Dame Sans Merci from Keats, and she is also the Lady of Shalott from Tennyson. It's the same character all these thousands of years. Um, so that's one type of magic. There are also vampires and werewolves, and they have their own kind of magic. There's natural earth magic. There are ma magic creatures that are neither good nor evil. They're just magical. You know, that's, it's their nature. Um, and then there's also the magic as manifested by, you know, Cthulhu, by the harvest gods and so on. So there's all these different kinds of magic, kind of like if the magic of each Native American culture was a manifesting powerful magic that you could see and feel, but they're all in North America. It's kind of like that. You have all these different pantheons, all these different approaches to everything from spells to, to religious ceremonies in constant potential collision with one another. We also see how some religions get along too, because 
other religions are allowed within the silver empire. And we see some of those, including one that worships Dagon and, and uh, uh, the, the, you know, again, another Lovecraftian type of, of uh, God, uh, but, but they're good guys, you know. Um, or so but, they appear at this moment in time. No, no, they're, they're actually, actually, the, the culture is good guy or good guys. In fact, the hero, the hero had, winds up with two best friends, male and a female uh, who are um, fantastic fighters. And the male guy um, is from a religion that worships Dagon, and it's it's their their god, you know. They, and and Dagon protects their fleets and so on. So, uh, you know, good guy. But I, I'm not sure somebody who's who's attacking their fleet and who might get you know swallowed uh, attacked by a giant kraken would probably they would probably not think Dagon's a good guy. So it's it's relative. You know, I, I think a lot. A lot of things are perspective, and I and I actually enjoy that a lot in books when you can go, they think they're doing right by them, and being able to put yourself in the perspective of a character, mm -hmm. I think that's fascinating, and I find at least the character has to be really well written in order to do that, that you can actually understand where they're coming from, not every choice they make, but I think that's what can throw somebody out of a story is that the character suddenly does something that doesn't make any sense at all. No. And a people think it's a reveal and I'm like, no, this just makes me hate you right now. No. Like, Every character should have integrity with who they are. And if a character does something anomalous, anomalous like that, they are acting out of integrity and that's a, that's a writer's error. And you have to watch out for it, but you have to know your characters and you know, like, even though they're, they're characters in a fantasy world, I always build my characters on the personalities of people I know. So that way I can kind of, you know, I know how they would move in, uh, under certain circumstances. Um, and it's also, there are some characters who are much more corrupt and evil and much more virtuous, um, but they're supporting characters in this. So, but mostly the characters are all in the gray area. No, I think most of us live in the gray area. We try to do what's right, but we're the reasons of our rightness, yeah. I guess. I love characters that flip flip flop sides according to their own goals and motivations. Yeah. And well, look, like, so like, and fantasy does that well. Oh yeah, it really does. And that's one of the things I like about the character Kagan. I mean, he's he's a good guy, but he's right from page one, things go so terribly wrong. <laughs> He's really screwed up in the head. Some of what he does along the way would be very morally questionable, but but there are also lines that even in his worst despair he won't cross. There are things that he wouldn't allow to happen in his presence, and um, that's interesting to explore. You can have somebody who is committing a crime over here, but they won't do this. It's kind of like like what you hear a lot about in. Um, uh, a lot of prison stories where you know are we going to do the pedophile thing in prisons where yeah yeah they I mean, it, they're killed it, and raped twenty it, women it, but you know, yeah it, it, pedophile it, kids in there and they're like they should die it's a weird double standard it's a very weird double standard and it, uh, in no way does it justify the double standard but it does exist you have guys who are um, like back in if you remember the the original Godfather their whole thing is they were into drugs I'm sorry they were into prostitution alcohol and every, and political corruption but they were against drugs. They were very against drugs. And that's why the, the Godfather himself was, was eventually killed. Eventually, you know, um, his empire was torn down because the new generation wanted to do drugs. So even within corruption, there are levels of how far a person, an individual will go. And that was fun to explore. I think that's really interesting. Um, oh my God, I had a thought a moment ago, but I've been chugging. I know. Just thinking about that word counts got you stressed out. Does you know? Does I don't stress me out over word count. Seriously, no. It was on the character thing because, you know, what's what's really interesting is when you have that moral slide of a character, and it's the actions they choose to take in that moral slide. Mm -hmm. Go down character stuff. I get very excited about character stuff, but it oh. seems to me like Valerie likes to have chaotic neutral characters that just run around. I, I do. I like chaotic walk. neutral characters because I, I it makes it easier to do a plot twist personally. Because, um, but it also is fun. Uh, a lit agent, uh, Sarissa Hernandez, taught me uh, the whole concept of goal, motivation, conflict, and doing it for each chapter for each character. And the more lines you can crisscross between each character's goals, motivate, like they can have the same goal, 
and the same motivation, but they have totally different conflicts or conflict against oh, yeah. each other's. Yeah, it's great. It's a great exercise for any writer. Yeah. Why um, did you suddenly make this podcast into all these lessons on writing? Like, how much Irish cream is in that cup exactly? Because we're talking to Jonathan Mayberry, and you're like, let me tell you some lessons. In no, no, no. This, this is a like, conversation. It's a conversation. I'm good with it. Yeah. That's just... No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should have. Huh. See, last podcast, I was drinking before we started. <laughs> this time, I'm drinking as we start. <laughs> so now I, I still have my senses, <laughs> senses about me, and I'm nerding out and want to talk craft <laughs> with everybody. And by the end of this, I'm going to be like, I'm pretty. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, going, going back to the, uh, the characters thing, um, one of the things I, uh, I noticed that in a lot of epic fantasy written by guys, women are uh, generally relegated to either girlfriends, victims, or lofty queens, but they aren't complex and on any kind of a par with the male character. And uh, I, I did not go that direction. I went and, you know, there are really strong female characters. In fact, um, the, the book, the cover, you can see, you know, the, the rose and, and the thorns and so on, and the dagger, the... Uh, there's a character known as the Poison Rose, my hero's mother. She was the greatest fighter of the age. He, he now has her weapons and her legacy, but he's still not as good as she was yet. He's, 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 he's good. I mean, he's, he's a tough son of a bitch, but he's still, I mean, the, the toughest female character is his mother. Um, his, uh, one of his companions is his ex-girlfriend, who's now with the other companion, and she is a no-nonsense uh, sort of character is basically telling him he's 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 too soft-hearted and he needs to to level up a little bit not in those words um there's uh there's kind of like a sherlock holmes uh sort of character where it's a really smart um manipulative character not even hold on more like moriarty but for the good guys and um she's this older woman and she's in there and there's a, a love affair between uh, two young women one of whom may not be entirely human, but there's all these different female characters within the story, as well as male, uh, good and bad guys. And I, I personally enjoy doing that because I hate seeing women in stories as decoration, especially in epic fantasy. Um, or they I, end up being really bitchy characters in the background. Yeah. Like if they are badass, I find a lot of times they're written, they're badass, but they're super bitchy characters. Like, you know what I mean? They're like the antip, you know, like this horrible version of females, like, you know, yeah. on their period or something. I don't know. And, and also, if if they if the woman is really tough in a lot of the stories, they make them tough in a masculine way, not tough in a feminine way. You know, I taught women yeah. self defense for thirty five years, and I know how tough women can get. Um, so I, I I when I was teaching women self defense, I never taught women to fight like a man, which is an expression that's, that always pisses me off when I hear it. Um, because like I'm, I'm six foot four, roughly the size of a bear. To teach the average woman to fight like me is, is, is ridiculous. They're not my size. Um, different anatomy, different muscular density, different bone density, different experiences create the need for a unique fighting approach that is female not male, not teaching women to fight like men, teaching women to fight like women. That's one of the reasons that one of my favorite martial arts, actually the martial art that Bruce Lee studied, Wing Chun, was invented by a Buddhist nun for a woman who was being harassed by a warlord. And that's the style that, event, that his, it was eventually passed down generationally to Bruce Lee. Wow. Uh, it was invented wow. by a woman for a woman. Wow. And it's regarded as one of the best, most combat effective Kung Fu systems ever. So I had no idea. That's a that's pretty epic historical fact that I will now have to research later. <laughs> yep. It's, it, you, you just look up Wing Chun Buddhist nun. It'll it'll pop it up. Wing, wing you know, like the word, and then C H U N. Oh. Okay. Well, on that note, as Valerie has found herself more stuff to research, um, <laughs> we are going to be right back with drinking with authors. Sample locally sourced, quality distilled spirits in the beautiful Columbia River Gorge. 
at Skunk Brothers Distillery. We're family owned, brewing small batch grain to bottle spirits, just like our grandfather did back in the Prohibition era. From handcrafted bourbons and moonshine to flavored blends and cordials infused with local fruit. Join us for a tasting tour and buy Skunk Brothers spirits straight from the source. It's all in the family at Skunk Brothers Spirits located in Stevenson, Washington. As we're discussing the intricacies of a gin and tonic, I feel much healthier now. Every time I drink one now, I'm going to be yes. like, I don't have malaria. It's a <laughs> you drink tonic, you're, you're not getting malaria. <laughs> I'm not getting malaria. What are you doing? No, just kidding. So um, now since we, we first met right as COVID had started, the, the, the COVID epidemic that is not really disappeared, but we live in Florida, so... They think it's gone. Um, so, or it never actually arrived here, technically, I suppose. Um, how has that been for you? Have you been able to do any in-person events? Have you done any in-person events? Uh, yes. Um, so here's the thing. I've done actually two in-person events uh, in two years. Uh, I, I did the social isolation thing pretty aggressively. And, um, you know, vaccinated and all that, that nonsense. And I went to um, one of my favorite conventions, which is Superstars in, in Colorado Springs, Kevin J. Anderson's um, business-oriented writers conference. And everyone was either vaxxed or had a negative um, you know, COVID test. Nine of us got COVID. Oh, God. Oh, my goodness. I got it hard. Oh, my God. I, the next, when, when it hit me, the Ooh. two days I laid in bed, it's like, take me now. It will be a relief. You know, um, it, was, it was awful. Um, and then I did one last weekend. I went to a writer's convention, not a writer's convention, a little writer's club in, in California. And I did not get sick. So, yay. So I'm hoping that having- We're Knocking on wood for you. Yeah, yes, having, we're going to knock on wood. Yeah. But- uh, my, kids, my kids brought it home from school and everyone just had like headaches and we didn't think anything of it. And then I came down sick. And like you, I was like laid up in the bed for two to three days. Like I had the flu kind of scenario thank goodness i was vaccinated because i think it would have been a hundred times worse but well, then we started testing everyone in the household and two of them had light pink that had had headaches so i was the only one in the whole household that came down with symptoms the rest of them came up positive for a time and then it was done yeah they, they you know people told me that it was going to be like the flu it was much worse than the flu um but and i but you know it didn't last i mean i, I would hmm. The, the intensity didn't last for that long. Yeah. But the other symptoms did, the cough and these weird bouts of incredible fatigue. I lost yeah. nearly a month of work because of that. Oh, and wow. uh, so I've been, I, I had to scramble to catch up and-, and No, I think that a lot of people akin this to a flu, but it's not, and it affects everybody differently. And there's some people that have a natural immunity. I know I'm, I'm vaccine boosted vaccine boosted that's what i like to call it the triple shot um but i i knock on wood have not gotten it but so many i know somebody who's She's gotten an it. hr rep <laughs> i have an hr person and i and i haven't gotten it but i know somebody's gotten it three times and has got the triple has been vaccinated just the booster shot and you know well, and they got it three times still since they've been vaccinated <laughs> my audio book main audio book reader ray porter is now uh in his second COVID, and he's been vaccine boosted, but he's been because of the. Um, I don't know if you saw the uh, Zack Snyder cut of Justice League. Yes, I did. So he's dark side. He's he's the 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 big. Oh, one, the, oh really? Yeah, um, and um, because of that, they were flying him all over the world to convention. He was in Ooh. Dubai and Australia and other places, and he came back with COVID. So I know you're going to Dragon Con because we're all going to Dragon Con. Are you worried about that at all? It's it's in my head uh, a little bit, um, but you know I've got also I'm going to Pennsylvania uh, in a couple of weeks to launch Kagan. You know, and it's at a bookstore where I launched tons of books before I moved to California, and there's always a huge crowd, and I got a feeling that if anyone is is not vaxxed or boosted or whatever. Uh, there's, there's, there's a risk. Um, then I go right from there to a writer's conference and then back here, uh, to California for a book tour. Oh, wow. Busy, busy man now. Yeah. I'm trying not to imagine, you know, the, the, the specter of death looming behind me. 
<laughs> well, do you, will you mask up and stuff, or were you, are you just like I'm rolling the dice? Uh, well, when I'm giving talks, it's kind of hard to because you know mics it, it messes with the mic a little bit, you know. But with distance, I'll, I'll I'll be without a mask. But when I'm up close, I'm probably going to wear a mask and probably do fist bumps instead of uh, um, handshakes. I've pretty much given up on handshakes. Uh, hugs, no, no, no. I mean. I'm not that much of a huggy guy anyway, even though I'm bear-like. I give good hugs, but uh, it's a pandemic. Y'all can stand over there. No, I think that makes perfect sense. It's so funny. I ran into, I had a photographer because I did a news article that's going, I think it's going to go tomorrow in the New York Times. And oh. um, he came to take pictures of me today. And I was like, he came up and he's like, hey, and I, his hand like went out, but not like a full Thing, but not a fist it was like this awkward kind of like yeah yeah thing. But, yeah, and yeah. I, was I like, don't know what I'm doing our, our air high five i don't know what we're doing anymore <laughs> i just don't even know how to socially act around that anymore yeah, like, I, I, I think i think this i think this should, should come back yeah. <laughs> we'll bring it back we'll bring it back we'll take it all the way to dragon crown it'll be great <laughs> people will be like why are all the authors doing that <laughs> how much have they been drinking it. already you know yes exactly yeah. it's okay I, if i wear a drinking with author shirt i'm just excused from everything <laughs> that i'm doing the entire day and, and dragon con is not you know if, if we get the big crowd again there's no such thing as social distancing going through some oh. of those, those places like yeah I was at Dragon Con last year and it was, it was, it felt packed to me, but everyone kept saying, this is nothing. And I'm like, this is my first one. Oh, no, and it's, it's usually 80 to 90,000 people. And, uh, it's crazy. And then, of course, we have, they're, we have, they're expecting that crowd back. They're yep. expecting that crowd back. And I and think San, San Diego Comic Con, too, was expecting the big crowd back. Yeah, I think everybody's, I, there was an article I read the other day that's everybody's, um, yesterday, that was like, everybody's done with COVID. I think it was in the Wall Street Journal. And we're not obviously done, but I think, you know, we've gone past COVID fatigue into COVID denial. And I don't know if we're going to go through all the stages of grief on COVID. Like yeah. from <laughs> well, unfortunately, too many people are still in the COVID stupidity phase. And um, oh, God. they politicized yeah. it to the point where instead of just being, you know, it, we could work together to get rid of a plague. It's like, no, there's no plague. Let me breathe on you. And, you know, like, I don't see the win in that. You know, no. I, I, the whole fact that it was politicized just makes me want to go around the country and smack a whole bunch of people real hard. Yeah, you would not have enough time for all of that. That would take you, though. Kind I, of fun, though. I agree. But don't actually, the last time we talked, you had a plague book that was coming out perfectly timed with oh, COVID. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Pandemica. Yeah, how did how did that go over? It's four uh, couple years later. How did that yeah, work out? A couple years later. How'd so, this go? So the phrase lead balloon it comes to me. So it I had written Pandemica. It's a comic book, five issue comic book, written it in 2019. It's, you know, by the time it was illustrated and the individual issues start coming out, it was 2020. Uh, yeah, 2020. And it started releasing at the beginning of COVID. So by around issue three, sales were tailing off because people were not reading comic books about the play. It would actually do better now. And in fact, it is doing better now um, than it did then. But they wound up not even putting the fifth, fifth and final issue out for a while because all the comic book stores closed. So what yeah, they did true. instead is they jumped ahead and um, uh, put out the graphic novel, you know, the, the, the trade collection, and that did pretty well. And then eventually put out the fifth issue. But now that COVID is, uh, is part of our cultural understanding to whatever degree it is, stories about, you know, dealing with plagues have become popular again. But between Pandemica and um, V Wars, both of which came out at the beginning of COVID, uh, timing was not great. Uh, I, I should have done something about puppies because we all could use puppies. Yes, yeah. yes. Maybe, maybe <laughs> that'll happen. You, Jonathan, to completely change your writing style. And what we would like is a sweet romance where well, everybody's you, happy. <laughs> I remember in the last podcast, Erica, you asked him if he, if someone approached and asked if he would do a romance, he'd probably give it a, his go. Of course. There's virtually nothing I wouldn't try if it looked like it was going to be fun and there was a paycheck that I liked. You know, it's got to be those two things. It's got to be fun. I got to get paid. 
but the fun is the most important thing. Um, you know, just because I write action stuff doesn't mean I'm not a romantic person, you know. Um, no, that wasn't it. I would just, it's not what you normally write, but if you're talking about puppies, everybody wants a sweet, they're out in the middle of a cabin in the woods. One of them's probably a pet, you know. Um, if, if, if my agent thought she could sell it for decent money and said, write me a puppy book, I would write a puppy book. That's awesome. <laughs> you could probably give me an elevator pitch right now. And I love that. I, look, yeah. he, look, he's, he's no, like, no, he's no. Doing one. Have him give the elevator pitch. Give us the elevator pitch, John. Well, you know, it's funny. Um, before I would do that, I had an idea for a, a dog book a couple of years ago. Uh, I never actually pitched it to anyone except my agent. But the new Channing Tatum movie, Dog, is almost that story mm. about someone bringing a, uh, a dog with PTSD that helps him with PTSD. It's the same idea. Clearly, it's an idea that a lot of people have thought about because, you know, they're doing they did the movie. But if I was going to do a, a, a puppy book, I'd probably do a, um, like a legacy book where uh, a family has been separated. And, you know, somebody because of, of um, disenfranchisement with their parents had just moved out, and moved away and unfortunately couldn't take their dog with them. But the dog wound up having puppies and the sister who stayed behind gets that puppy to her. And um, so she now has this puppy that is the, you know, the, the offspring of, of the dog she grew up with. And, um, you know, it just it makes her remember more about the family and the good times. And the parents, you know, the, the one bitter father, because he's got to be the bitter father, mm -hmm. is remembering buying that, the first dog originally for the kid. And, um, you know, it's thinking about her with it now and the good times they had together. It's that, that's and I'm just making this stuff up as I talk. That would be a story I would want to write. A legacy thing, you know. Like one for anybody puppy listening, puppy. a legacy puppy dog book can be from Jonathan Mayberry John ready. You for the right price. I think that's this amazing. Valerie, what have I told you about eating on the show? <laughs> Who's eating? <laughs> yes. She does this and then Christy tries to talk to her and, and then chokes <laughs> on things. On the podcast, you know, we can see you. You have a camera on. I can tell that you're already a little bit buzzed because you're not even thinking about that. <laughs> you're like, I'm just sitting here with Jonathan Mayberry hanging out. I'm going to have a snack. I'm just going to do the thing. Did you bring enough for everyone? No, she did not, <laughs> child. <laughs> Sorry. What are you eating, by the way? What are you eating now? A Krispy Kreme donut that this red hot and fresh sign was on when I passed it. Sounds yummy. It is. It is amazing. It's like a yeast roll covered in sweet glaze. Yeah, there's nothing healthy there, but it's all good for the soul. <laughs> it's good for the soul. That's right. It goes very perfectly with your not Irish coffee. <laughs> I don't know what this is. Just because you put Irish oh. creamer in it and made it Irish coffee? <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's Irish-ish. I mean, it's, it's it's Bailey's. It just needs a new name, you know. Uh, fairy with... coffee or, or uh, <laughs> you know, something. I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I'm bad Anyways, at this. Anyways, we're, we're working. I love the fact that she's an epic researcher and she doesn't look this up before she does it. Like, epic <laughs> researcher. I don't, I don't research like liquor. <laughs> All and I know is that vodka clearly happened in the Middle Ages and because it was Intermerchant's Journal in Sardinia, which was the capital of trade during the Dark Ages. Mm -hmm. And it was also closest to the largest leper colony that specialized in potato growing. So I suspect the lepers created the vodka for obviously cleaning wounds and started trading what was left over. And this is why you don't work for any vodka company's PR department. I'm just saying <laughs> oh leper vodka. <laughs> the thing is, I would probably buy a bottle of leper, vo leper vodka just because it was named leper vodka. <laughs> Valerie, I think you can pitch it. I'm just saying, I think that's a pitch right, waiting to happen that's right there. <laughs> and you can have some, a girl with a billowing white dress walking through a field and want to know where your vodka comes from and these lepers come out of these houses. See, now that's got to be in, in, a, in, a, in a novel or, or a show or something. You need to write that. Here we go. 
No, write it down, Val. Grab another post. What? I have, a, the, I have that in Cedric the Demonic Knight. It, that, that's He comes across the lepers. And then Roma Santa, the werewolf, hides on, at the lepers' colony because... Does it involve vodka? It is the question. Scent. Yes, they drink all the vodka. <laughs> I would. I can't wait. I'm actually going to go look up again how much vodka they drink in your book because I'm going to do a comparable magnitude. Because <laughs> since you're not a drinker, what people are doing in your book? My one character is the bartender. <laughs> but that I never. Is- but he's. But he never. I never get a scene of him pouring any drinks because shit's happening, like the troll breaking the pool table and shit. As trolls do. As yeah. trolls do. So. Wanting, <laughs> wanting to fight in the back alley with somebody. Of course. Anybody. Oh my goodness. Okay. What books have you been reading, Jonathan, during this two years? What books? Uh, have you been well, I, I, I do a lot of rereading lately. Actually, I haven't read as many new books as I have uh, re, you know, rediscovering older books. Um, the Carl Edward Wagner Kane short stories and novels, uh, oh, one yeah. of the best epic fantasy characters ever. And unfortunately, they're all out of print, but I, I, I went up having old copies of them. Um, I, I fell in love with Joe Abercrombie's uh, First Law epic fantasy stuff. A lot of Robin Hobb. And Robin actually gave us a really nice cover quote for the book. Um, but I, I got I went did a deep dive into late 19th, early 20th century uh, horror stories. H.L. Mencken and M.R. James and, and those, those guys uh, on audio. Um, my... Uh, I, Let's see what else? Uh, Joe Lansdale's Happen Leonard books. I reread that whole series, and they wound up in my my most recent Joe Ledger novel. Oh wow! Uh, it's it's fun when 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 you have friends who you know play along. Um, you know, Lansdale's like, yeah, yeah, of course, put them in there. And uh, the, my next Ledger book's going to have F. Paul Wilson's Repairman Jack in it, um, which is you know, I have good friends. Uh, what else have I been reading? Oh, tons of stuff. Like right now, I'm reading a lot of nonfiction stuff about the Dead Sea Scrolls because the next mm-hmm. Joe Ledger thriller is all about the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I do a ton of research and reading on the topics as well. Um, that's and a lot of stuff for cover quotes. If I remember, it's the Dead Sea Scrolls was the first time that they found Archangel Michael's name written down in a certain way. Cool. See this. This is this is. Don't ask me about liquor and drinks, but ask me about other random shit. Yeah, I know. I'm. I'm, I'm with you. I'm a. I'm a research junkie <laughs> for sure. So, <clears throat> you know, I love Dead Sea Scrolls, and um, there's always fun stuff happening in in history because they're constantly adding new technology to reinterpret or, or go deeper with with his, historical stuff, and that opens up doors for guys like me to write thrillers. Um, and I'm about to write the next Joe Ledger thriller. That's nice. very, very cool. So, um, do you do, I could have sworn somebody, you did a blurb for somebody's book. Who the hell was it? I've done quite a few blurbs. Yeah. With Rick Hines. Did you do a blurb for Rick Hines's? No. No, no. you did a blurb for Rick Hines's, Eric. I know I did a blurb for Rick Hines's. You know what? <laughs> Shut it, woman. <laughs> um, I don't think so. I saw your name on a blurb of a book that just came out. What the hell was it? Uh, let's see, Rear Yours, Christopher Golden, Samantha Underhill's Book of Poetry, Jesse Wolf's Book of Poetry. Um, tons of stuff. Uh, Maria Snyder's Book of Short Stories. A uh, lot of stuff. I, no, I no. give okay. out a cover quote, uh, one in about every 10 books that I read for a potential cover quote. Um, the stuff, and I won't name names, of course, the stuff that I don't give out quotes for either I don't feel as well enough written or there's something in it that that triggers me. Like if there is pointless abuse of animals, women or, you know, some other group where it's it's not a pathway to telling a story about the the, the, the consequences of, of a horrible act, but it's there for cheap thrills. I'm, I'm done. I'm out. Um, and there's a couple other things. Uh, a- animal cruelty is, is an interesting thing because there are times when you need animal cruelty because it's a story about animal cruelty. And there are times when you just have, a, you want to show how bad the villain is by having him beat a dog to death. And if it's gratuitous like that, I'm, not, I'm out. You know, it's interesting you say that because I was having a conversation on this podcast the other day with somebody and we were talking about how 
never kill a dog. Like there's a website of where you can look up whether or not in a book, a dog dies. Like they keep track of this is literally a website dedicated to whether a dog dies in the book. I have one. I've read a book where the dog dies in the book. It's How probably on this website. It's because a, people yeah. It's a supporting character dog, but I got mail. I got emails about it. I got emails. <laughs> and the, the dog that's that's in my Joe Ledger series, Ghost, who has been pretty badly hurt in a lot of books, I get plenty of of death threats. So if you killed Ghost, I'm going to kill you. That's sort of, I mean, hopefully said in the spirit of fun, but um, the dog's pretty safe. No, but people get really excitable about this whole premise of if, and, Dogs seem to be the number one animal. You start with dogs and then it starts down a list of you actually injured it. And, and I thought it was really interesting because you could rape and kill and mutilate whatever. But man, if you kill a dog or you beat a dog. Yeah, but but I have I do have other triggers too. You know, gratuitous rape in, in, in fiction, you know, if especially if it's on screen, like if, if like a, one nation conquering another, there's sadly always rape in in invasion like that but you don't need to show it you can talk about it you can talk about the effect of it but you don't need to actually write the scene in which case in which somebody's being raped that sort of thing i think it's poor writing and it speaks to um some issues the writer may have it's one of the reasons i don't like the genre of of, of movies called torture porn oh yeah um, yeah i they're not i'm not the audience for that I, I need a reason for something to happen and I don't need it to be gratuitous. I don't, I don't get my jollies from seeing people actually get, you know, abused and hurt. You know, it's interesting. I was talking horror movies. You're a horror writer. I'm a horror writer. Let's talk about this for a moment. Is I don't like gore. Like I like a horror movie that is scary, obviously blood and stuff, but it's just, if you start into a horror movie and all it is is gore, I completely lose interest. That's a thing for me. It's going to be gory. We could talk about, for instance, your lovely vampire barista <laughs> um, and how what he does in the hospital, ripping apart those people and what they walk into, but you don't describe it in such a way where that is the entire focus it's, of that it's, scene. Because it's not the focus. It's, it is part of, the, of an unfolding event. You know, um, it's interesting because the cover quote I got from Robin Hobb kind of ex explains this. I just want to real quick read it. Um, she said, the book is violently honest and honestly violent about the horrors of war. Um, That's great. That's a great quote. Yeah, Ro Robin loved the book and, and she's an amazing writer and I, I'm glad to have her endorsement. But yeah. No, but I agree, but... When you look at the horror and stuff like that, and even going into a horrific scene, and I'm gonna use the word horrific versus gory, because it can be horrific and it can be disgusting and nauseating. I could come up with any million of these words, but it's not gory. And like, I have a, like, that's one of my things when I'm watching, because I used to watch all of the horror movies at one point in time for anybody who, freaking remembers blockbuster i had rented every single horror movie that blockbuster had like i had already seen them all and i went back and i'm like okay what do i want to rewatch until new ones came out but i remember my pivoting moment was cabin fever and i rented to cabin fever and i it started and the girl rips her thigh off or whatever and i'm like off like i don't want to watch like that wasn't it wasn't scary and it wasn't spine tingling. It wasn't anything. It was just gross. Yeah. And that's interesting when it, when it comes in zombie films, because you, I mean, the, the, the nature of zombie films is they're going to be gory. It's people eating people, but the way in which it's done, um, like in Romero, who is, you know, unrelentingly gory at times, he even started changing the color of the blood to make it less in your face. He made it darker, you know, so it didn't look like human blood. So that you got the point of you know of the violence without it necessarily being completely real. He didn't want it to be too real. They do the same one in the Walking Dead TV show where uh, Greg Nicotero, who, you know, whoever sees all the special effects, has changed the zombie blood. A lot of it is CGI and it's black for the most part. Yeah, no, I agree because I think again, it and it's true with vampire things too. It's like when they bite into the neck and it just sprays out in like this rainbow posing.
I'm like, have you ever looked at Bud's blood spray in your entire life? Hello, person writing this. Like, what? You know? Yeah. But then, uh, then if you kick a dog, it's all over. Like, you can rip body parts. You can have them hanging from the ceilings. But if you kick the dog when you walk in, end scene. Like, ever. <laughs> Val, do you have a question, my love? No, I may have drinking my drink too fast. And now I'm just like, <laughs> and that. It's the that alcohol really version of brain freeze. You know? Right. There we go. That's what, that's what, a, yep. Oh, was that a word? Was that a word you were trying to get out of your mouth? It there? was. It was. <laughs> I don't even know what word it was. I don't know what, what I was trying to say. But no, so I what was going to. Well, stick up for you. So, Jonathan, anybody who wants to come on the book tour, is it national? Is it international? No, no, I, I, I don't want to do a, 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 a huge book tour. So, I'm, I'm doing the launch in Pennsylvania um, because I was already invited to come out to the, um, uh, the Writers Conference, Pen Writers. And I decided to come in a little early and just launch the book at, at this bookstore that I have such a sentimental attachment to. Um, when I come back to, to California, I think I'm only doing five or six signings. Um, it, with COVID, I'm, I'm not really not looking forward to his, doing as many in person, but I'm doing Mysterious Galaxy in San Diego, uh, Dark Delicacies in Burbank, um, Artifacts in Encinitas, and one of the Barnes and Nobles in Santee. And there's one other, I can't remember off the top of my head what it is. But we've been pushing a lot of, you know, purchases, you know, online um, so that if anybody pre-orders the book, they actually get a signed book plate. So I, I created Kagan book plates. Oh, and, nice. and they're, they're, they're you know, it's not that easy. You just tear off the back and stick them in the book, um, which is a, a more antiseptic way of doing book events these, you know, these days. That makes sense. Okay, so I do have to ask this question before we go into shameless self-promotion and wrap up. Who would you cast as the lead character in this book? You know, that's that's a funny thing because um, Ray Porter, you know, my, my reader is, is currently recording it and he's had, he's had some suggestions, but nobody, not my agent, my editor, myself or Ray can think of who we, who we want for, for Kagan. He's 5'10", athletically built, late 20s with curly hair. Good looking, but not like, you know, like an Ian Summerholder is too good looking to play him. We want someone who looks like he's been hit a few times. But I don't yet know who that actor is. And so I'm going to, when the book is out, once people have had a chance to read it, uh, because then by, th by that point, my film agent will be actively shopping it. I'm going to have a, th a thing on, on Facebook for dream casting for Kagan. Um, like everybody seems to all have the same idea who we want to play Took, the guy, uh, his, his best friend who you know, worships Dagon. Uh, Jaman Hanshu, um, African actor, big guy. Um, oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. He's almost who I had. I mean, I pretty much had him in mind when I was writing it, um, though I kind of was between him and uh, uh, Mahershal Ali, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and for Philia, the, the uh, female warrior that's a friend of theirs, um, I've been kind of leaning toward um, what's her name? Uh, she, she played Orphan Black. She's going to be She-Hulk. Totally, oh, my and God. I, I love Maslani, her. Tatani Maslani. Because yeah. she doesn't look like she's a brawny fighter. But if you train her, train the actress and get the right, you know, uh, stunt person, you would have someone who fights with speed and wit rather than muscle. And well, she could pull that off, too. I love Orphan Black. And she is so brilliant. How she did oh, yeah. play with Emmys every single year that show well, was out. I don't understand. You know, I have a weird and and currently inexplicable inexplicable connection to Orphan Black. So I was I was at I was I think I was in Texas at a, at a convention, and I got back to my hotel room and I turned on my social media and my Twitter was blowing up, and everyone said, "Oh my God!" You know, um, the, in Orphan Black, you know, there's V Wars and 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 Rotten Ruin in in the episode. I'm like, wait, what? Oh yeah. So apparently someone, and I don't know who, uh, there's a scene, there was one episode where they go into hiding in the basement of a comic book store. Mm -hmm. And all the, the big posters outside are V-Wars posters. And inside there's Rotten Ruin. And the very first line um, in that scene is, the, uh, as, these, as they're coming in, the, the store owner says, I, I guess you're not here for the latest issue of Rotten Ruin. And we still don't know how that got on their radar. And it was mind blowing. You know, and it still is mind blowing. It's so cool. So 
that's one of the reasons, one of many reasons I want Tatiana Maslany to play Philia because I want to ask that question of her. You know what? I bet you I would look up who wrote that episode. I did. No connections to anything that I know of. I think it's just a comic No, they could person. just be huge fans. Well, that, that's because... probably what it was. They, they were fans. Yeah, no, I love my, that. My agent thought was, thought was uh, since some of the writers in uh, Orphan Black were younger writers, Maybe he had Rotten Ruin in high school and, you know, back in 2009 and was sentimental about it and has followed my career. And when he was writing that script, decided to do that. That's the theory. And I have no idea, but it's so cool. That is, that is, that is awesome. Uh, there's also some independent film, which I have yet to find. I, I got to find the title of it, but apparently a uh, young African-American couple are, are in a library talking and she's reading uh, V Wars and she's telling about V Wars. And it was not nothing to do with the company that made V Wars, so I don't know. Wow, no, stuff like that drives me nuts. You know, I think that is one of the sincerest forms of flattery, though, when people oh, yeah. put things in there like that and make reference to it. I think that's amazing. One of the more surreal elements of that is when you find out that a celebrity who has no connection to you at all is a fan of your work, like Wayne Brady is a huge fan of Joe Ledger. I just found this out the other day. It's like, what? Because I asked a friend if he'd ever read that series of mine because, you know, um, we're, um, he's going to be working, writing a story for an anthology we're doing with that character. And I asked how many of the books he read. He said, I read all of them. Wayne Brady uh, turned me on to them. I'm like, who? What? You know, <laughs> now I know who Wayne Brady was. Whose line is it anyway? And, and let's make a deal. And, you know, um, but I'm like, that's so random. Um, Barack Obama started following me on Twitter a few years ago because apparently he reads thrillers and he read my stuff. Stuff like that is just frigging surreal. <laughs> and when you get into the business, you never think anything like that will ever happen. You never, you don't, it's not even an idea in your head, you know? And then when it happens, it's like, okay, am I in a coma and dreaming this? Because if so, leave me there. <laughs> okay, so Wayne Brady, if you're listening to this, Jonathan Mayberry is going to be California at book signings. Oh. Come out and have your book signed by him. That see <laughs> that one you'd hug. Admit it. That would be a hug if he went. That would be a hug. That would be a hug, and I'd probably give him COVID, and you know. <laughs> and and <yes, laughs> the whole episode, thing. How I gave Wayne Brady COVID <laughs> from hug. Oh my goodness. Okay, let's do shameless self promotion. Let's talk about your new book. Okay. Well, Cake of the Damned comes out May 10th. It is the first in an epic fantasy series about um, a guy whose entire life has been destroyed. And he, his, his whole thing was, his job was to protect the children of, the, of this empress. And he wakes up to the entire empire being destroyed. He was asleep, drunk in a prostitute's bed. Um, and, um, I hate those mornings. No, just and, and, be, and because he failed to protect the children, li his gods literally appeared in the air as, as giants and turned their back on him. So his soul, he's forever damned for that. And he's trying to redeem himself. And, and that's uh, page one, correct? Actually, yeah, I'm not, I can read you the entire chapter one. Okay, go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Kagan Vale woke to the sound of his own damnation. That is chapter, okay, chapter one. one. Entire chapter, chapter one. Boom, okay. done. Okay, Jonathan, how is it best for people to follow you? I already know the answer to this, but say it out loud. So, well, if you spell my last name right and notice there's no Y in the middle of it, Jonathan Mayberry, um, long A. Uh, I am on. I have a website. If you're a writer out there, there's free stuff on my website for writers, comic book scripts, and all sorts of stuff. Uh, I am on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. Instagram and I am just now learning TikTok because apparently there's something called book talk. Which, oh yeah. Which I am very new to. I have exactly one video up on TikTok right now. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting up to speed on that. But I'm all over social media. I do a ask me anything every Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific time on Facebook. And uh, I give out prizes for my favorite questions. Very, awesome. very cool. To give you an idea, by the way, one of the people who, who won a prize last week was um, uh, one of the I think, unit director or, or something producer on Picard. Oh. 
Yeah, and another guy it has done like like every superhero cartoon show, Chuck Dixon. Um, oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, he's, like, he's like, oh, I love your stuff. I'm like, what? You know. Um, so you never know who's going to show up on those on those uh, those little uh, strange ask me anything. So I'm easy to find. Wayne Brady this next time. I'll be Wayne Brady. <laughs> that that would that would be cool. You know, that would be, that would be very, very cool. cool. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for being on our podcast again. We love having you. Uh, th- this is a lot of fun, and it's not just because I'm drinking bourbon. <laughs> or the Mal got caught eating yeah. donuts. Or but, uh, well, it's not so much caught as as we are sharing your experience vicariously. You are so pleasant to her, but she's a hot mess. What the hell? <laughs> Just yeah, Eric has, Eric has met me in, in person. Alexi has met me in person. He, they got to deal with me at Bard's Tower this weekend. So cool. I'll be doing a bunch of Bard's Tower things with them uh, over this, this coming year. Well, Sweet. I'll have to stalk you. Not on the website. I love you, Alexi. Get your website up to date. Just yeah. saying. <laughs> hashtag, just saying. Okay, threw it out there. Okay, Jonathan, thank you so much for being here. Pleasure. This has been Drinking with Authors. I've been your host, Erica Lance, and my co-host who was eating donuts and drinking pretended Irish coffee that she made up was Valerie Willis. Our amazing guest has been Jonathan Mayberry. Our sponsor has been Skunk Brothers Spirits. DWA10 is the coupon code, and we will see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.